working in the city of uh, New Brunswick. I also worked in the city of Newark. Uh, I worked for, which is now Rutgers PD, it was a UMBNJ. So we own University Hospital. Inside Newark is a, it's a level three trauma center. Level three, level one, it's the highest. So when stuff goes bad, you guys saw the lead graduation when we landed helicopters, that's where they're taking them, usually there or they're gonna go to Jersey Shore. Um, trauma center means these surgeons are amazing. They handle the worst of the worst. So as a police officer, I was actually in New Brunswick when the first plane hit the building, it was on the TV, you could hear it uh, on our police band radio, we get all the other towns in the chatter talking about it. Um, I went to one of the windows in one of our high buildings and I could see the first tower smoking. I was like, oh man, that's bad. And again, everybody thought it was like a plane possibly had flown into a building by mistake. They didn't know. And then a short time afterwards, I heard, I didn't see it happen, but I heard the second plane had actually hit the building. I saw it on video and I looked out the window, I could see the second building smoking. It was, it was crazy. Um, so at that point we had, uh, I was actually in Robert Wood Johnson Hospital, which is in New Brunswick. And the police department didn't know what to do. We just knew that there was gonna be a lot of casualties and issues in, in, in uh, New York City. So they were uh, mobilizing all of us to go up to University Hospital in Newark. And uh, I was married to my, uh, my ex-wife at the time. Uh, she was pregnant with my son. And I was like, I'll see you when I see you. I don't know what's happening. I don't know when I'm gonna come home. Uh, so they took, we had about 25 cops in my campus. We went to University Hospital. And we're just waiting. We're just waiting. We found out about, obviously, the Pentagon. There was uh, misinformation out there. They said that a plane had hit the Sears Tower in Chicago. There was a lot of chaos going on. We were just trying to make sense of it. You hear that noise? It gives me goosebumps to hear it. You didn't hear any planes. If you heard a plane, everybody was kind of like in panic at that point because they had put all the planes on the ground. The only thing that could fly were the military planes. So uh, I went up to New Brunswick, uh, from New Brunswick rather to Newark, and we were just waiting, figuring this massive buildings had fallen. We're gonna be sending over all these people by boat because we were a trauma center, there were helicopter people over. Nobody came, nobody, not one. So then it was even more surreal for us. We are like, okay. How come nobody's coming? The interesting thing that we saw, that I saw, is that there was a lot of people showing up in the hospital to donate blood. People came and said, you know what? I want to do something. I want to help. And everybody, I was very humbled to see that people didn't make a difference what they looked like, what their nationality, likes, interests, if they were Red Sox fans, Yankee fans, they were all there to donate blood for the hope of being able to help somebody. Being able to help somebody in need who may have been trying to survive from this terrible uh, attack, at least in New York City. So, the rest of my story goes, you know, I was able to uh, get in touch with my wife a little later. You couldn't touch anybody on cell phones, but I was trying to call friends that I knew that were in the city. Um, it was like a day and a half or so, I got to go home. Um, I ended up going back in the city uh, a bunch of days later. It's a different story, but it's, it was a time that I'll never forget. Um, I was a very new police officer. I became a police officer in 98, this was in 2001, and uh, it was just amazing to law enforcement my business. No one had ever seen this or knew how to prepare for this. So, the benefit of going through this is we learned a lot of different lessons, we learned a lot of different things. Like, we have TSA when you go to the security in the airports now, there's so much more security, and some people really get annoyed by it and upset. It's there for a reason, okay? So, um, not me talking anymore, I'd like to, uh, just kind of run through our teachers and have our, our special guest uh, filters. So, uh, Ms. Ryan, do you want to cover? Yeah, yeah. So, I, um, I was new. I was a new teacher. I was 26 years old. I think it was my third year teaching. I was at Woodmere School. And at the time, Fort Monmouth, Fort Monmouth isn't open anymore. We don't have a military there anymore. But when I was a kid growing up in Eatontown, Fort Monmouth was a huge part of our town, okay? We had a lot of soldiers and their families living in our town. Um, so Fort Monmouth was a hub. I mean, a lot of my friends lived there. Their fathers were generals and, and so on and so forth. Um, 
And as a teacher, I had a lot of these military kids um, as my students. So that's really important um, to understand because when I was teaching at Woodmere, I taught sixth grade, okay? So they were about your age, a little younger, and I was dropping my class off at the library. And I'll never forget because I'm walking my class down the hall and we get to the library and the librarian was kind of like strict at the time. So she would like, she liked everything to be quiet, but she, and so she always had this like really stern face, but this particular day, she looked like not only like serious, but she looked terrified. And as I'm walking down the hall, I'm like looking at this lady and I'm like, God, what is up with her today? You know, like, why does she like, what is wrong with this lady? And she's just looking at me with this fear in her eyes. And, you know, so she tells the kids to go in and, and I'm like, I don't want any part of this lady today. Like, I don't, I don't really want to get into it with her, you know? So I'm like going to walk away and drop my class off. And she says my name is white. And I'm like, oh God. And my class goes in and she says, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. She goes, um, a plane hit the trade center. We may be under attack like that and I was just like what you know and she said do you know anyone that's in the city and um, my sister was just happened to be going to um, she was doing some modeling back then and she was going to a modeling sh shoot right down at Port Authority like right in that area and I said I think my sister is there and um, so she said call her call you know call home or whatever find out where your sister is um, so um, I ran back to my classroom and went to the teacher's room. I dialed my, my sister's phone number at home to see if she wasn't home. Sure enough, she, she was sleeping, so she had overslept, which is typical of her, and, um, and she missed it. So I knew that everyone I knew was safe, um, but that said, um, what she said was we were under attack. She thought we were under, everyone was saying we're under attack. So I was very, very, very scared because I thought that if they were attacking the United States, that they would be maybe attacking Fort Monmouth, and that's really where we lived. So when I got my class back to the classroom after library, there was an announcement over the loudspeaker by the principal saying that there were bees outside and that we wouldn't be going outside to play. We wouldn't go out for recess, we wouldn't go out for gym or anything like that. So everyone had to stay in their classrooms in the school because there were these bees. And I'm like, oh man, like, I knew the truth, but I was just like, I don't know. I was getting more and more scared because we were basically in a lockdown, but we weren't telling the kids that. And then there were these announcements over the loudspeaker. Ms. White, can you please dismiss John Smith? Ms. White, can you please dismiss Sally? Can you please dismiss me? I keep getting these announcements in my classroom to let these kids go home. And I'm looking at them, realizing little by little, I'm going, wow, they're all the military kids. Like these parents must really know what's going on and it's big and it was like little by little I want to say like 12 of my kids went home early that day and they were all the military kids and I got so so scared I was so scared um, so um, that was my perspective sort of as a, as a teacher because I was kind of like what's going to go down what if what if, I didn't know, I didn't know who, if they were gonna attack, I didn't know. I just knew that we lived in a town where there was a lot of military and I felt very, very threatened and very, very scared that it was, I was so young, 26 years old, and I was responsible for these children and I was terrified, terrified. Um, I lived in um, Bradley Beach at the time. So um, when we, my roommate and I, when we got home, we taught together. When we got home, we walked down to the beach and we could actually see the smoke from Bradley Beach. So Bradley Beach is over by Belmar. So if you've ever been on Belmar Beach, I could literally see the smoke. It was a clear day. I mean, today's pretty clear, but it's, it's foggy. But I mean, it was a crystal clear day and we could see smoke coming down from New York. Um, on an even more personal level, um, I went to Red Bank Catholic High School and I had, um, I was on student council and one of, uh, 
another girl that was on student council with me, um, her name was Beth, we, she and I were very good friends. And after high school, kind of um, went to college and kind of lost touch, but I ran into her about a week before, maybe two weeks before 9-11, because I was school shopping. I was shopping for my new clothes for school. And I went into this store called Ann Taylor, and it's it's like, um, it's right on like, um, close between Lake Shrewsbury and Red Bank. And in that big shopping plaza that has, um, I don't know what you guys would know, I don't know, whatever. So I go into this clothing store, it's kind of like fancy, and I'm trying to buy nice fancy clothes. And I see my friend Beth, and I'm like, what are, you, what are you doing to work here? In the back of my mind, I'm like, I'm surprised she doesn't have like a more professional job by now because she's just super smart, super smart. And she goes, I'm working here. I worked here all summer because I get a discount on clothes and suits. She goes, because I got a new job at Tanner Fitzgerald at the World Trade Center. And I was like, whoa. And she's like, yeah. She's like, you know, whatever. So she was working there. She got a job at Canada Fitzgerald, so she was trying to get nice clothes. Um, anyway, um, she got the job at Canada Fitzgerald. I think she was on the 94th floor. Um, so she, um, I believe, um, died when the plane hit the building um, because the plane hit right below her. So um, I don't, I would we like to believe that she died right away, that she didn't have to suffer one of those people that were hanging out of the building. I also had another friend, Peter, um, who was in our class, um, who worked for the same company. He worked there a little bit longer than Beth, and he too um, died. So um, this, uh, I'll never forget, um, you notice of all the towns, Beth was from Middletown, of all the towns, Middletown I think has the most. Uh, a lot of people commuted to the city um, by train from Middletown. So they parked their car at the Middletown train station, took the train into the city. A couple days later, my friend and I, a couple friends and I went to the Middletown train station and there were hundreds of cars out there. And a lot of them had flowers on them because those were the people that drove to work that day but never got a chance to drive home. 9-11 hits differently for all of us, but it's the same for all of us that back then, 22 years ago, we were Americans. We were all Americans. We all loved this country. When that those planes hit, we were all together, all what in my shirt, all loving America. Today, things are a lot different, and it breaks our hearts, all of us here, it breaks our hearts, because America is not the same as it used to be. We used to stand as one. Unfortunately, things are a little bit different today. But the same is for all of us that none of us will ever forget that day. Thank you. Uh, okay, guys, thank you for uh, coming out, watching, and listening today. Appreciate all the red, white, and blue you guys have on. Proud to be American, right? Like Miss Ryan was saying, uh, I was one of those kids that was a military kid. Uh, my family lived on Fort Monmouth for a couple years until I moved by Woodmere School. Um, my father served in the military for 20 years. Both my grandfathers served in the war, World War II. So I took a lot of hurt that day. My family was very hurt. Monmouth County, Eatontown, when 9-11 happened. I was in ninth grade on September 11, 2001. I was at the high school. Uh, I was only in the high school for a couple days, a couple weeks maybe, when, when this event happened. Um, very shocked. I remember that when it occurred, um, they put the TVs on and we saw the planes flying into the Twin Towers. Yeah, you guys ever see like King Kong as he travels through and just knocks the buildings over? Kind of looks something like that. We couldn't believe it. Very shocked, very sad that it was actually reality. Something you would almost see in a movie, right? Something that unfortunately was true. Um, very difficult. Okay, you guys kind of know what it's like to have the world shut down when you guys went through the pandemic. Okay, it kind of felt a little bit like that. 
Um, but we bounced back quicker with 9-11. We didn't just stay home for months upon months. We weren't locked in. Okay, we, we rose up. Okay, we as Americans, like, like the teachers have said, we stood together, we united. Um, we were not gonna be like wimps and just give up like that. Okay, we, we're proud to be American and we, we stood together with that. I remember every family, every home had an American flag hung outside. Okay, it was awesome to go up and down the road and see how proud we were to be an American. Okay, yeah, maybe you see that for around the 4th of July these days, but it is different, the world we live in today. I'd like to get back to that at some point, but as you guys know, politics kind of play a part in this, so maybe we'll get back to that sooner than later, hopefully. But um, we could do it, okay? It starts with us, okay? If we do unite together, we're proud to be an American, we do the best we can, we'll get there someday. You gotta believe in that. You guys have been through your own times, like I said before, okay? I wasn't alive during Pearl Harbor, like Officer Henley explained before, but I was alive during 9 11, okay? I was alive during the pandemic, like you guys. Will we have things in the future? Yes, unfortunately, more things will happen. We can't control that, right? But as long as we have our family, our friends, community, we'll get through it. Thank you guys, appreciate it.
had no idea like what was going on. Um, eventually, I think our principal at the time got um, on the loudspeaker and told us that something happened, but it really like wasn't clicking for the students. The teachers knew, obviously, but uh, we didn't. And it was just like a crazy time, really. Like when we talk about how you just never forget, like the exact day, I know exactly what it was like outside and the sky and just everything. It brings you right back, even though it was so many years ago. It was just, it's just crazy to think about. Um, I remember going home that day and going on the trampoline with my brother and we were able to see smoke like later on in the day. And it was just like very surreal. It, really just, it didn't click until you saw on TV and my mom explained to us and it was just heartbreaking. And um, just crazy. Every time, you know, we, we come here and we always tell these stories and it, it doesn't get old. It, it's just amazing from everyone's perspective. Everyone had something different happening or in, we're in a different part of their life and it's just really wild to think about. So it really hits home. Um, my uncle was supposed to go into work. He worked in the Twin Towers and he, um, for some reason, didn't go to work that day. So that's one thing. Um, my parents, actually, their anniversary is on September 11th. And on their fifth anniversary, they, there was a restaurant at the top of one of the uh, towers. And they went to dinner there on September 11th. That was years ago. Um, so it was just, it's just crazy to think about when you put the time schedule together and you think about what could have happened or if they would have gone to dinner that day or, you know, or planned on it. Obviously it happened in the morning, but just crazy how certain things lined up. Uh, I was going through the yearbook at Mrs. P and she was just looking at when I was in um, Memorial or maybe Meadowbrook, there was a yearbook there. And she was like, there's so many kids in this, in the book. That's when, when we had Fort Monmouth open, there was, I had so many friends that lived there. So it, was, it, it affected a lot of people, um, obviously differently, but you know, it's just amazing how America came together and just, you know, like Mr. G was saying, I hope that we can be that way again because it really brought us very close. My story is not as this heartwarming. I mean, I, I remember 22 years is a very long time ago, and I remember everything about the day. I was actually working for an interior designer in Red Bank, and we came into work. And at the time, everything was just on the radio, and we were just hearing about. We were listening to this like really cool radio station with WPLJ, and the guys kept talking about the disc jockeys. And Mary turned around um, and she turned to me and she said, you know, I, I think we should close up shop and see what's going on. So we did. And I remember going home and sitting like right in front of the TV, like not on this couch or the chair, like right in front and just watching everything unfold and really be amazed like what was going on, like in shock. And my husband at the time, I didn't have any children. My husband worked for his family's business, which is a big towing company in Newark. And Ted was working there and he called and said he was safe. You know, they, they were, you know, okay, but but his company, the, the Denty Brothers Towing, volunteered, you know, after everything got settled, and they brought in all their big towing trucks. I mean, they towed for the turnpike. They had, like, the big tow truck and dumpsters, and as and soon as everything got settled, I remember them, the whole yard was emptied out and, and went to the city to help as much as they could to help with debris and... But I do remember exactly what I was doing. And, and unfortunately, I don't remember a lot of things, but 22 years is a long time. And I remember exactly the car I drove. And you know me, you guys know me, I forget everything. My phone, you know, you know, Miss B. But I remember the car I was driving. I remember being in, this, in the, um, the, the, the building, you know, work. I remember Mary turning around to me and what she said. I remember driving home, sitting in front of the TV and just in shock. But I didn't have any military family or friends. Um, that was really basically, I mean, I was proud that my husband's family were there all the time helping. Um, that, that was really all I have to say. Um, you know, of course, it, it's, it's a tough time for everyone. And, but like Mr. G and everyone said, we'll all get through it. We'll all get through it. Um, off the record, girls, do you want to sit down? Oh, okay. All right, so that, that's my story. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Yeah.
that anybody stand in for a while. We had one young lady who had her legs locked for one time. We were here. She passed out. So if you are standing, make sure you stretch your legs a little bit. Yeah. Really fast as well. um, but uh, I'm kind of excited. I, I really want to welcome our next guest. It's one of our students, uh, Eddie's dad, uh, who's a fireman and still is a fireman in Shrewsbury, to kind of explain some of his experience as a fireman. You can see we have some really cool artifacts that he brought in to share with each and every single one of us. Magenheimer, if you would share for us. Uh, you know, your... Good morning. Like you said, I'm uh, Ed Magenheimer. I'm Eddie's father. Um, back in September 11th, 2001, I was actually an assistant fire chief for the Shrewsbury Hose Company. And I also worked for the borough of Shrewsbury. So between 9 and 9.30, we have a coffee break. And we were going in a little early, about a quarter of. And one of the guys came running out of the back and said, hey, you know, a plane just hit uh, one of the towers. We're like, really? You know, we thought maybe it was an accident, something like that. You never would have thought terrorism until we actually were watching the film footage uh, with all the news crews there. And when the second plane hit, we actually watched it live. So right then and there, we all knew, you know, this wasn't an accident, this is terrorism. So being the fire chief, I ended up going up to the firehouse. We wanted to make sure all our equipment was, you know, fueled up. I brought one of the trucks down, fueled it up down to the borough garage. Uh, we had a meeting with the police department, the emergency management, the first aid. And we ended up uh, going to the Central Jersey Blood Bank because, uh, like uh, Officer Henley was saying, a lot of people wanted to help and they wanted to donate blood. So we actually went there, helped man. I mean, there was, I want to say, at least two, three hundred people coming to donate blood because everybody thought there was going to be a lot of injuries. Unfortunately, it was all casualties and uh, fatalities and stuff like that. But um, to go along with that, we worked you know, really close with the emergency management. Um, I got a piece over here. It's an actual urn that's got some of the debris from 9-11. It was given to the state police, OEM, which uh, the, the gentleman I was working closely with ended up becoming part of the state police. So I want to show you that piece that I got there. Um, the other scrap pieces here, it's a piece of uh, steel from 9-11 from one of the buildings. And there's a hydrant valve from the FDNY from one of the fire trucks that was actually crushed from all the debris falling down. I end up getting that because my father-in-law works up in Corny, and a lot of the debris, when they started cleaning up everything, a lot of the scrap metal ended up going to their yard. So he knew that I was a part of, not up in New York, but trying to help out on a local level and he thought I would really enjoy that. So that's why I've got those pieces that you can take a look at. Um, on a personal level, I had a friend of mine, the best friend growing up. He, uh, his father worked at uh, the World Trade Center and he was actually in both attacks. I don't know if you guys know, they actually had a car bomb a few years earlier on the bottom and they tried to knock it down that way, terrorism. Um, so he actually survived that accident and he was lucky enough to survive the planes crashing into the building. And I believe he actually got some kind of a citation an award for actually helping people get out because like uh, Officer Henley was saying, the elevators weren't working and everybody was trying to get the stairwells and get down and I know there was an older woman, I think she was kind of handicapped or whatever and helped her getting out. So, you know, um, so it was crazy. Uh, I know we had two families that lost members in Shrewsbury. Uh, a couple years after 9-11, they actually have a gazebo at Borough Hall in Shrewsbury dedicated to the, uh, the heroes and the victims of 9-11 and they got their names on uh, plaques and stuff like that. Um, trying to think what else. Here, I got a fire helmet that I created in 2009, and I brought it to a car dealership, and Justin Tuck, who was our defensive captain for Giants, actually happened to be there. And he goes, where did you make, you know, where did you get this helmet? I said, I made it. He goes, I would love to wear this to honor 9-11. So in 2010, the very first home game of the new stadium, September 12, 2010, Every year, the Giants, Jets, they usually remember 9-11 and the first home game in September. They'll honor the heroes, the, you know, the victims, FDNY, NYPD, Port Authority, everybody. So he actually said he wanted to wear it, and he actually did. So after they did the ceremony and all the players came out of the tunnel, he actually uh, wore the helmet, and it was all over plaster and stuff like that. Because of that, um, I was lucky enough in 2010 to be placed on a ticket, all because he wore my helmet honoring 9-11. Story to a sad story, but you know, you know, kind of neat ending for me personally for what I've been through helping out and stuff like that. The people that I know. So, what are the um, autographs that are on the helmet? The autographs are just from other players that I brought in the helmet up to the stadium. Um, there's Eli Manning, there's Daniel Jones, there's Victor Cruz, there's um, I think a couple of the other ones. Uh, Strahan, Justin Tuck, obviously, because he wore 
Yeah. 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 Ye
and um, you know, he worked there for many years, and uh, he knew Khaled, like all his co work he knew co coworkers, Fourth Authority police officers, he knew like a lot, uh, the fire department, the Fourth Authority, he knew a lot of people, so then um, a couple months before 9-11 happened that year, uh, his boss comes in to his office and tells him like, hey, uh, we're going to transfer you over to Journal Square, which is in uh, Jersey City, and that's where he still works now at this time, and, you know, he's like, okay, that's cool, but, you know, it was difficult for him to leave, because, like, he knew so many people, and he's starting something fresh, going somewhere new, but, uh, it took him months to fully transfer out, because, you know, at that time, they could, you know, like, the giant computers, all the stacks of the reports and boxes, so, you know. It took him time to move out, and, um, you know, over the couple months, um, he was moving out into uh, General Square slowly. But then, uh, the day before 9-11 um, happened, uh, September 10th, 2001, he was fully moved out. He did not go back into the uh, Trade Center. Um, he was settled into uh, General Square at that time. And uh, 24 hours later, he goes into work, casual, nothing, nothing happened, you know. Sits down in his office, starts on the R reports he does, and uh, goes to some meetings. And then once he's sitting at his computer, in his office, he has windows on his uh, right side, and you can look out and you can perfectly see the two twin towers standing with just uh, the side of his eye. And then uh, he's sitting there, and then before you know it, he witnesses the first plane hit the tower out the corner of his eye. He turns and looks and he hears it. And then, like, he's just sitting there in shock. He just doesn't know what to do at that time. And then his boss tells everyone just to stay put um, and to see what the uh, police have to say about that at the time. And then, um, you know, minutes, was it, minutes or hours later, he went to the second plane, hit the tower, and then that's when he, was, he got up and just try to rush home, because at that time my family lived in uh, North Bergen, which is close to Jersey City, and uh, it's right along the Hudson River, so at the time my mom was home, and then all she had to do was just walk out of the house, and then it was just filled with, she could see the smoke, the smoke was pouring into the neighborhoods at that time in North Bergen, and you know, she tried to contact my dad, my dad was just like, trying to rush home as fast as he can, but it's just difficult to think that in a matter of 24 hours, my dad could have been one of the victims of 9-11, uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't even be standing here right now if, you know, you went to the trade center that day. And, uh, you know, he knew countless, you know, Fourth Authority police officers, that's why I have the hat, and the uh, symbol here, this is a symbol. All, all of uh, Port Authority police, they have the Twin Towers here with the American flag. And uh, he knew countless co-workers, bosses, friends. You know, he knew a lot of people that passed away that day. And, you know, it's difficult for him to speak and uh, share a story all the time because he always tears up whenever he remembers, you know, everyone pretty much. Because he worked there for... 15 years at the Twin Towers before, you know, he uh, transferred over, but it's just crazy to think that 24 hours, my life just changed, but thank you. Awesome, thanks for sharing. So one of the other things just came to mind, I remember right after this had happened, um, the Yankees were in the World Series, and I had a, not a Yankee fan, got a ticket to go to the World Series, and I was in the outfield, and um, it was, it was an interesting game, I'll say that, but uh, it kind of got all brought together, and you kind of felt like it was a push in the right direction. President Bush at the time was the president. He got to come and throw out the first pitch, and there's a lot of different things you can watch on different documentaries. The guy had a full flak jacket on you know, to protect him in case someone were to shoot at him, and he threw a strike like no other, and I think Derek Jeter joked with him and said, hey, don't, don't bounce it there to the catcher because they're going to boo you, but... When he came out, after he threw the first pitch, they made an announcement that the flag that was on top of the World Trade Center was actually flying in center field. It was all tattered and torn and stuff. 
and they had a jet that came over, and that jet went like straight up. And you could feel the thrust, and it really invigorated the crowd. And like everybody started chanting USA, USA. And it was kind of like everybody really coming together and showing that, you know what, we're going to take this, everybody together, we're going to be together and, you know, as Americans. And it was really an interesting point for me. Uh, last but not least, we have Tyler, another former student, outstanding young man who would like to share some of his. Uh, He's actually our Jimmy Gerbis Award winner uh, last year. So Tyler, come on up and share your perspective on things. On Monday, September 10, 2001, my stepmom went out to dinner with her friends at a restaurant that had an incredible view of the Manhattan skyline. On that night, she made a comment about how beautiful the Twin Towers looked in the night sky. The next morning, Tuesday, September 11, 2001, my stepmom went to work during her first full week as a teacher and followed the typical morning routine with her fourth grade class. After all, it was supposed to be a normal morning. This normal scene went away quickly when the only other teacher in the hallway she was in, the other fourth grade teacher at the school, told her what happened. Just like everyone else, they had no idea what exactly was going on. All they knew was that there had been some sort of explosion in the North Tower. The teachers were prohibited from turning on the TVs in the classroom so as to not scare the kids. So her great partner took her TV and put it in the hallway so they could constantly get updates. This, the, the news mortified my stepmom because her best friend worked two blocks away from the towers and would take the train every day to the World Trade Center stop. She tried calling her from her classroom, but to no avail. My stepmom also thought about how her father and brother had only stopped working in the World Trade Center a few years prior to the attacks. Even though smoke could be seen in the distance out of the large windows of the Bayonne, New Jersey school, she had to continue her day with minimal updates from the TV out in the hallway because she still had a class to teach. When she went home at the end of the day, she finally got in contact with her friend and, thankfully, she made it home safely after many hours. Finally, my stepmom described the change in the world between September 10, 2001 and September 12, 2001 as a loss of innocence. In terms of what I think as an American, while I am disgusted by the events of 9-11, I do believe the aftermath of the attack showed how strong of a country the U.S. is. Despite the near 3,000 lives lost on September 11, 2001, the U.S. unified in order to rebound from the tragedy. This unification was made clear during a speech at, at the time President George W. Bush gave uh, a few days after 9-11 in which he said, I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people who knocked, down these build who knocked these buildings down will, all he will hear all of us soon, followed by loud cheers from the crowd. Everybody had each other's backs during these difficult times, and everybody showed the power of the American people the American people have when they are unified. This great unity is the reason why 9-11 will, will never be forgotten, and it is also a reason why I am a proud American.